Knowledge of human capacity is important for understanding the physical performance of a task and allows us to design work tasks that are suitable for our abilities and natural tendencies. We also need to know how the stages of information processing from the original stimulus to the response happen to appreciate how humans interact with complex environments. For example, how does a pilot interact and respond to controls and displays in a cockpit? What role does sensation, perception, and memory play to help the pilot respond appropriately? Human information processing theory relates human cognition to that of a computer. We receive inputs through our senses, we process that information in our brain, and generate an appropriate output as a behavioral response. You can liken this to a computer where your senses are the peripheral inputs like a webcam, microphone, mouse, and keyboard, the brain is the central processing unit, and the behavioral responses are output through the monitor and speakers. In the model, we have six important phases. These are not listed in sequence. Sensory processing, perception, memory and cognition, response selection and execution, feedback, and attention. Sensory organs gather information about the environment, machines, products, and any software we're interacting with, and they convert this physical energy to electrical signals and send it to the brain. The limitations of our sensory organs can affect our ability to perceive stimuli. For instance, if you have hearing loss or vision impairment, you might not be able to detect a stimulus. All sensory systems have an associated short-term memory, which is temporary storage of the representation of raw stimuli prior to processing. Our visual, or iconic memory, is very short, only 100 to 500 milliseconds. Our auditory, or echoic memory, is a little bit longer and may persist for up to 3 to 5 seconds. Iconic memory is believed to play a role in change blindness, which is the failure to detect changes in a visual scene. Many studies have shown that people struggle to detect differences in two visual scenes when they're interrupted by a brief interval. The brief interruption appears to erase the iconic memory, making it much more difficult to make comparisons and notice changes. The practical applications of this in the workplace could include fast-moving equipment posing a hazard as you may not notice it moving. You may have also experienced something similar while driving and a deer or motorcyclist appears out of nowhere in front of you. An advantage of our echoic short-term memory being slightly longer is that we can hear something once and process it as more information is being gathered. Unlike our visual system, where we can continuously scan an area to receive information, when we hear a sound, it is usually only presented once, for example, during conversation, so we need to ensure that nothing is missed. Our short-term sensory memory, combined with working memory and long-term memory, are involved with cognition. Cognition is the mental action or process of acquiring knowledge and understanding through thought, experience, and sensation. It involves the interaction of short-term and long-term memory stores that include perception and attention. Material that is rehearsed in working memory can become long-term memory, which indicates that learning has taken place. Working memory is a form of short-term memory that lasts approximately 30 seconds. It is the process of actively rehearsing and manipulating information in the mind. This type of memory is useful for mental math, remembering phone numbers, directions, and simple instructions. Long-term memory is the semi-permanent storage for different types of information, including semantic memory, which is knowledge about the world, symbols, and concepts, essentially knowing what something is, episodic memory, which is our memory of events, situations, and experiences, and procedural memory, which is our memory of how to perform specific tasks and skills. All work requires specific knowledge related to the field of work and specific skills such as how to use a machine in a safe way, or even how to organize a meeting. To go from our working memory to long-term memory, we need repetition and feedback. The more you repeat a task, and the more appropriate feedback you get, the faster you'll be able to learn that task. Perception also plays a big role in our daily life and work environment. Perception is the process of decoding the meaning of a raw sensory data. It includes top-down and bottom-up processing. Top-down processing is perception that is based on previous expectations and associations. It involves situational context and can help us perceive things even when the quality of the features are degraded. Bottom-up processing relies on feature analysis based on raw sensory input. For example, how many feet does the elephant in this image have? Bottom-up processing helps us identify that this is an elephant and we see what appear to be four feet on the elephant. But when top-down processing takes over, we know that feet need to actually be attached to the leg and we can correctly identify that the elephant in the photo does not have any feet. Because bottom-up processing relies on raw sensory information, it's great for immediate identification. We process sensory information as it comes in and build the picture from the smallest pieces of information possible. For example, in this picture of an eagle, your eyes detect features such as the outline of the wings, head, and beak, as well as the proportions of the eagle, 
Your brain pieces it together and you perceive it as an eagle. You don't need context to identify it because it has a simple background. If there'd been other birds flying around with it or a complex forest background, then we may need top-down processing to accurately classify the eagle. Top-down processing is driven by cognition. Our brain applies what it knows about the context and what it expects to perceive based on the previous constructs for that situation. For instance, black lines have a different perceptual construct based on context and sequence. Without context, the features aren't easily identifiable. We need top-down processing to figure out if the lines representing these letters are an H or an A. Even though they're identical shapes, the context of the word allows us to accurately classify the letter in each word. Using top-down processing increases our accuracy dramatically because it uses cues from the environment to guide the decision, but this is at the cost of being much slower and more fatiguing than bottom-up processing. Look at the shape in the box. Seen alone, your brain engages in bottom-up processing. There are two thick vertical lines and three thin horizontal lines. There's no context to give it a specific meaning, so there's very little or no top-down processing involved. Surrounded by sequential letters, your brain expects the shape to be a letter and completes the sequence. In that context, you perceive the lines to form the shape of the letter B. Now let's look at the same shape in a different context. Surrounded by numbers, the same shape now looks like the number 13. When given context, your perception is driven by your cognitive expectations. Now you're processing the shape in a top-down fashion. In these example pictures, what does bottom-up processing help you identify in each image? What about top-down processing? Because our brain is trained to identify faces, bottom-up processing quickly identifies the shapes of the faces in the rocks in the left image and a face in the negative space of the image on the right. Top-down processing allows us to use the context of the image to identify that the faces are in fact just arrangements of rocks and trees in the left image and a saxophone player in the right image. For workplace decisions to be made with ease, we want bottom-up processing for quick decisions, especially when it's an important decision. Guidelines for optimizing perceptual cues in the workplace give us three clear recommendations. First, we want to maximize bottom-up processing whenever possible. This allows for automaticity, quick decision-making, and limits fatigue. Examples of this might include high visibility vests, legible signs and markers, and clearly distinguishable audio cues. This helps us prevent confusion from similar messages and makes it easier to perceive differences. An example of this can be seen in this first image. Here we have security guards or employees that are wearing high visibility vests and they easily stand out from the crowd. In this next image, however, it highlights how context is so important. We now have security guards that are in high visibility vests, but there are also many race participants wearing similar clothing and it now makes it harder to identify where the security guards are. In this instance, we couldn't rely on bottom-up processing. We'd have to use top-down processing and get additional cues from the context of the scene. Secondly, we want to maximize automaticity by using familiar perceptual representations. Ideally, we don't want to have to read a label to know what something does. For instance, we know that blue bins are for recycling. We want to use familiar fonts, language, icons, and symbols to make it easy for users to select the correct response. We can see this in computer software interfaces, exit signs over doors, as well as, as, well as things like images on bathroom doors to indicate which bathroom it is. Lastly, we want to maximize top-down processing when bottom-up processing might be poor. We can do this by using discriminating features, creating context for the situation, exploiting redundancies such as using both visual and auditory cues, using small, easily accessible vocabulary, and being aware of things that may cause perceptual errors like poor lighting, noise, or fog. With something like the switches on the center console of a car, it's hard to use bottom-up processing. So in this case, we want to use multiple cues such as location, shape, and maybe a helpful light to help us improve the context. Another clear example is with fonts. Serif fonts are much clearer than sans serif fonts. Serif fonts support top-down processing when conditions are poor, such as with low resolution. The next thing we're gonna look at is response selection and execution. Understanding a situation is achieved through perception and augmented by cognitive processing, which triggers the selection of an appropriate response. The selection of a response will be followed by the execution, which requires a motor effort. This is another opportunity for error to occur. One thing to consider is that we cannot respond immediately to a stimulus, and the latency between the stimulus and our response is known as reaction time. Reaction time is related to the amount of information we need to process before initiating a response, as well as the number of potential responses. The more things you have to think about, the slower your reaction time will be.
Hicks law indicates that the time and effort required to make a decision increases with the number of options, or task complexity. If we have to give a response in a certain amount of time, but the complexity requires more time than we have, we may not select the appropriate response. This response time curve is a logarithmic function which shows increasing time with increasing task complexity. One thing we can do is practice actions to reduce the information that we need to react to and make the process more automatic. This is important because the bottom line for design is to reduce the complexity of information that is presented to an operator. If information can be simplified, for example, by graphically representing it rather than using text or tables, it'll lead to faster processing, which results in faster reaction times and fewer errors. Our goal as ergonomists or human factors engineers is to focus on reducing task complexity to limit human error and improve response time and work efficiency. Before we get into the nuances of signal detection, we need to understand how we respond to a stimulus. There's a range of sensitivity to stimuli that varies across each sense. We can express the sensitivity of stimuli from the smallest detectable stimulus to the upper limit of what we can perceive. The absolute threshold is the stimulus intensity required to detect the presence of the stimulus some proportion of the time. An example of an absolute threshold is the number of hairs on the back of one's hand that must be touched before it can be felt. A participant may be unable to feel a single hair being touched, but may be able to feel two or three as this exceeds the threshold. Absolute threshold is often referred to as detection threshold. As the stimulus intensity increases, we must be aware of the just noticeable difference, which is the smallest change between two stimuli of differing intensities that we can actually detect. The upper limits of a range of sensitivity define the safety limits and pain threshold. For example, the maximum safe sound pressure level is 85 decibels for an 8-hour exposure period, and sound can become uncomfortable at about 110 decibels and cause pain at 130 decibels, which we would define as the threshold for pain. Our thresholds are important in situations where we need to identify stimuli, such as hearing an audio cue and picking out different tones. If your desired response is based on input tone, the tone should be very easily distinguishable, well beyond the just noticeable difference. As we get older, we lose the ability to hear high frequencies, so workplace design should take that into consideration with the design of alarm signals and machine notification sounds and ensure that they're at a frequency between 1000 and 5000 Hz, which will typically have the lowest absolute threshold. There are different thresholds for different levels of information processing. The physiological threshold, which is the absolute threshold for sensory organs to pick up a stimuli. The detection threshold, which is when we can identify that something is there, but we might not necessarily be sure what it is, movement, light, or sound. The identification threshold, which is where we can identify the features of the stimuli, such as shape and color, and the recognition threshold, which is where we can conceptually categorize the stimulus, such as being able to name what we can see, hear, or taste. We have different methods to assess thresholds. In the method of constant stimuli, the levels of a certain property of the stimulus are not related from one trial to the next, but presented randomly. This prevents the subject from being able to predict the level of the next stimulus, and therefore reduces errors of habituation and expectation. For absolute thresholds, the subject reports whether he or she is able to detect the stimulus. For difference thresholds, there has to be a constant comparison stimulus with which each of the varied trials are compared. The method of adjustment asks the subject to control the level of the stimulus. It instructs them to alter it until it's just barely detectable against the background noise, or is the same as the level of another stimulus. This is repeated many times and is also referred to as the method of average error. In this method, the observer controls the magnitude of the variable stimulus, beginning with a stimulus that is distinctly greater or lesser than a standard one, and then varies it until they think the levels are the same. The difference between the variable stimuli and the standard one is recorded after each adjustment and the error is then averaged. One thing we need to consider with information processing is that information transition isn't perfect. Ideally, information is transmitted without any loss or change from its original form. However, the transmission process from stimulus to the operator and then the subsequent response may modify the information, and the type and amount of information present could degrade the quality of transmission. Think of playing a game of telephone, where you listen to a verbal stimulus, attempt to remember everything that was said, and then repeat it to someone else. They then continue this process. This might be easy if the message is, pull this lever, but becomes more difficult as the complexity increases to something like, pull the yellow lever first, then push the green lever halfway, then flip the red switch, and then pull the green lever back to its original position. As you can see, this is a much harder instruction to remember and is going to result in more error due to the complexity. So in an ideal world, our stimulus information equals the transmitted info, which then equals the response info, 
However, we know that this isn't necessarily going to be the case. Affordances help us intuitively make the correct responses. Information processing requires us to look at the situation and then select an appropriate response. Ultimately, we want things designed so that people can intuitively make the correct response. As we master a task, we need less cognitive oversight and we're going to improve our accuracy. If you have all of the correct stimulus info, then you should expect to have perfect responses. But humans aren't perfect. We can only process a finite amount of information and retain it. Additionally, there's a decay rate between the stimulus and response, and human information processing capabilities are going to be the cause of these potential mistakes. Task complexity, or how many steps are needed to plan and execute a response, and the reaction time required for the response are going to be the primary factors in determining the quality of information transmission. Now let's talk about signal detection theory. Signal detection is a paradigm or common situation used to understand sensation, perception, and even higher level functions. For example, medical diagnoses, observation tasks, or hearing the phone ring while you're in the shower. Because we don't necessarily accurately perceive what is sensed, signal detection theory helps us understand patterns or biases. Signal detection helps us discriminate between two discrete states of the world that aren't easily discriminable. Essentially, we're looking at is the signal present or absent? There are two challenges. The level of the signal has to cross the threshold of detection, and any noise present may affect the threshold level. So difficulty can be increased by neural noise, which is present at all times. Noise in the environment, such as ambient noise in the form of touch, light, or sound, is always present unless you're in a special experimental chamber. If you're listening for an auditory cue, it might be hard to hear if there are other noises in the area. Additionally, stimuli presented close to the sensory thresholds lead to false alarms and misses. A signal detection experiment might look something like the following. On each trial, a low-level sound is either present or absent, and you must judge its presence or absence. There are four options in this 2x2 matrix. Hit, miss, false alarm, and correct rejection. A hit is when you accurately identify that the signal is there. A miss is when the signal is present and you don't identify it. A false alarm is when you think the signal's there, but it's not actually there. And a correct rejection is when there is no signal and you correctly identify that. If the tone is loud enough, or if the participant has very sensitive hearing, then all responses would be a hit or a correct rejection. But because of threshold variability and the influence of noise, there will be misses and false alarms. For this experiment, you want to make the stimulus as close to the limits of detection as possible. Neurons have a rate of firing that encodes the strength of the stimulus. Remember, a neuron won't fire unless there's a minimum level of stimulus energy to activate it. Very low levels of energy may activate a neuron because they're very near the threshold for that sensory neuron. The sensation we have that relates to the rate of firing is called the evidence variable and is designated as X in equations used for signal detection theory. Assume we can measure the neural activity corresponding to the presence or absence of a tone. Signal to noise ratio tells us how strong the signal is relative to the background noise. If it barely crosses the level of the noise, it will be hard to detect. A weak signal won't be easy to distinguish from the noise, while a strong signal is much easier to distinguish. Variation in activity may be a direct result of the presence of the tone, or from the noise in the environment, or even from neural noise, since random variation in neural activity is common. In hearing tests, for example, you're asked to identify when a tone is present, which is used to identify your absolute hearing threshold at different frequencies. Because we're inherently aware of the noise in our environment, we set a response criteria to assist in our decision making. It may be subconscious, but we can move that criterion based on the situation. If we're really focused on correctly identifying that a signal is present, we can shift to the left, which will result in more hits, but will also result in more false alarms. We can select the appropriate strategy depending on the risk associated with the task. If it's riskier to miss a signal that is present, we shift our response criterion to the left, and if there's more risk associated with not identifying that a signal is absent, then we shift it to the right. This means that we'll have more hits when we're more liberal with saying yes, and more correct rejections when we're more conservative about answering yes. Discriminability index, represented as D prime, is the sensitivity of the signal detection system. A large D prime is a high sensitivity, so there's a greater difference between signals, which means that it's easier to detect the presence or absence of the signal. A small D prime means we have low sensitivity. A smaller difference between responses means it's more difficult to detect the signal. The further apart the signals are, the easier it is to discriminate. Think about hearing a very low frequency bass tone and a high frequency treble tone versus two similar mid frequency tones. 
Another example is in MRIs. We have a low discriminability index with gray, black, and white images, and a higher discriminability index with color contrast MRI. These could be personal differences, the probability or likelihood of an event happening, or the payoff. Personal differences could include things like the level of risk aversion. If we shift our response criterion more to the left, we'll be more liberal and more risk-taking. If we shift response criterion to the right, we'll be more conservative and more risk averse. Depending on the situation, you may need to change your strategy. However, some people are more likely to take risks than others. The probability distribution or likelihood of an event happening can also shift our response criterion. The more likely something is to happen, the more likely you would respond with a yes. The payoff will also have an effect on shifting our response criterion. If there's a reward for answering yes and little penalty, then you'll shift your response criterion left and get more hits. However, this will also lead to more false alarms. Alternately, if there's significant risk associated with misidentifying when a signal is present, you may shift to the right to ensure correct rejection. For a practical example, think about working on a factory line. You need to identify when there's an error with an item. This is a hit. If it takes an extra 30 seconds for you to pause the assembly line to double check the item and it didn't have a problem, but causes a five minute delay if you miss the error, then you'll most likely shift your response criterion to the left and will be more likely to pause the line so you don't miss the defect. While this may result in more false alarms, in the long run, it will likely result in saved time. Response criterion bias can also depend on things like culture, the instructions you've been given, and your experience with a task. Some people are just more prone to say yes. This gives them a lower probability of missing and a higher probability of hitting, but also a higher probability of false alarms and lower correct rejection rate. Some people, however, are more prone to say no. This results in a higher probability of misses and lower probability of hits, but also gives them a lower probability of a false alarm and a higher probability of correct rejection. Probability is related to how frequently something happens. If it's happening very frequently, you're much more likely to say yes. On the flip side, if something like injuries are very infrequent, then you're less likely to pay attention to the stimulus and identify something as a potential risk factor. Signal detection performance and response bias can change with time. This change is not only between individuals, but also within a single person over time. As we age, our discriminability decreases as our hearing and vision decline. Additionally, over shorter periods of time, we may experience changes in our signal detection performance. Vigilance decrement is when signal detection performance decreases as you perform a task. When you do this task for a long time, your discriminability decreases as the work becomes more automatic and you're no longer paying as much attention. Alertness is the ability to pay attention over a period of time and prolonged monitoring leads to poorer performance after about 30 minutes. So for optimal performance, we should be taking a break every 30 minutes. Even a one minute break helps us to regain our focus. Signal detection performance also decreases if a signal doesn't happen very often. Think of a fire alarm drill or evacuation simulations. Additionally, signal detection performance can also change over time due to training, fatigue, or environmental conditions. So how can we avoid things like vigilance decrement? We can use shorter shifts or memory aids, more training and experience, enforced breaks, feedback with alarms, signals or controls, and we can focus on removing noise and extraneous stimuli, which increases the signal to noise ratio. An example of this would be a factory environment requiring people to wear hearing protection. It may not be because the threshold of noise is over the limit. This may not be because the threshold of noise is over the safe limit, but because it helps prevent distractions that prevent them from focusing on their task.